So this is the story about how I was almost kidnapped by a co-worker. Who knows what he was planning? You tell me. When I was in high school, I worked at a family-owned plant nursery and garden store. At the time this took place, I was a cashier and had been working there for two to three years. It's important to note that while I went to high school, I also attended a vocational school. The students at this vocational school came from high schools all over the county, so it wasn't uncommon to have friends that know people from a few towns over. The place that I worked was the perfect spot for a teenager to get a job. There was a good mix of adult employees and teen employees, and a fantastic place to work. During the summer one year, a boy started working there. For the sake of the story, I'll call him Connor. I recognized him from the vocational school we attended. We got a bit friendly at work, but I would have never considered him a friend, just a co-worker or acquaintance. TBH, I always had an off feeling about him. His mannerisms and actions just made me uncomfortable, but I had no reason to be mean, dislike him, because he never really gave me a reason to. It's hard to explain, but it was a gut feeling of some kind. Before I go any further, I want to give a little more context about my job. To get to work, home, I took the bus or got a ride from my dad. The bus stop was a 15-minute walk from my job, and the ride included a transfer at some point. If the buses were on time, it was a 25-minute commute. With rush hour and late full buses, it could take 45 minutes plus. My dad only really drove me to, from on the weekends. After a few weeks and the more interactions with Connor, I started to get the feeling that he liked me. Whatever register I was on, there were multiple throughout the store, he would frequently make passes at and sometimes even stop to chat for a minute. I always maintained a friendly co-worker vibe and did not do say anything that may have made him feel different. One day, he asked if I wanted a ride home. I found this odd because I didn't think he had a car, as I always saw him skateboard to work. I just declined, and we went about our day. The next weekend he asked again, and again I declined. I asked if he had a car, and he said no, but he could ask to borrow a car from his parents and drive me home. I told him that wasn't necessary. I didn't mind taking the bus and it just so happened, that day my dad was picking me up. This exchange probably happened five to six more times. Gotta give it to him, the boy had some persistence. Every time I politely declined, but after the third time, it started to creep me out. In my high school, teenage girl mind, I thought I was making it pretty clear that I wasn't interested in spending more time together. The last time he asked, I caved. He asked early in the morning. It just so happened that day, it was planned that my dad was going to pick me up from work, but he had told me on the way to work. He wasn't going to be able to. I can't remember why. Something with his girlfriend, I'm sure. Anyway, I was feeling pretty bummed about having to walk and take the bus. If I remember correctly, it was supposed to thunderstorm all day. Connor came up to me as I was opening my registers and said, Hey, I finally got my own car. I was happy for him as our conversations at work in recent weeks were about his parents possibly bringing him car shopping soon. We talked about it and I congratulated him lol, and he asked if I wanted a ride home that day. At this point I was honestly fed up with that. I thought, what the hell, maybe if I say yes and let him drive me home this once he'd stop asking. So I agreed. The day goes on and eventually lunch rolls around. I take my break and go up to eat in the break room. When my break's almost over, another employee comes up and starts talking about how there was a couple cop cars in the parking lot with their lights on and two officers went on to the admin office. The rest of this story is what I pieced together from what others told me. The local police made occasional drive-bys of my place of employment the owners had some family friends who were officers, and they looked out for them. I guess on this day, that family friend cop did a drive-by and noticed a car in the parking lot that had been reported stolen that morning. 
he pulled over to investigate. I guess at this time, when another officer pulled up, a backpack was spotted, very crappily hidden behind a nearby tree. They did some investigating, found some things along with an ID, and went into the admin office. Police officers tell the owners what they find, and Connor is called in to speak with them. As it turns out, Connor had stolen his uncle's car that morning. The backpack that was found had his ID in it along with rope, duct tape, and a switchblade. When he was called into the office, his uncle and parents were called. I guess the uncle said he didn't want to press charges, which is why Connor didn't leave with the police. The boss asked Connor to leave for the day, and he did. IDK if he was questioned about the contents of the backpack. And if he was IDK what his answers were or the reasoning is for having those things. No one knew that he was going to give me a ride home that day. I hadn't told anyone. It wasn't until after all this went down that I told my mom. I didn't mention this before, but my mom worked in the admin office. Connor didn't work there long after that. The whole thing creeped me out so bad, I made it a point to not run into him at the vocational school. I remember using humor as a coping mechanism of the whole weird thing. Oftentimes my mom and I would joke around about the guy who was going to kidnap me. I only remember this now because two to three years ago I was scrolling through Facebook when I came across a shared in memoriam post. I recognized the face, and when I clicked through the profile, it clicked where I knew this face from. It was Connor. I blocked this kid and this clearly traumatizing experience out so well, I completely forgot about him. His name that we worked together. What happened? And by this time, it had been eight years. After some digging, I learned that he died from a drug overdose and on his profile, it had previous places of employment, one being my old job. This made me message my mom. I texted her and said something along the lines of, me, do you remember Connor insert last name? Mom, are you serious? Me, what? Mom, you mean the guy that was going to kidnap you? That was all she had to say. I had a crazy flashback. I was so surprised and concerned that I could block something out like that. I'm clearly still trying process as it's been two years since that conversation with my mom. But anyways, that is my creepy and terrifying encounter. This story occurred a few months ago. There are these three abandoned houses as well as three barns close to my house and are going to be getting torn down here in the next couple of months, so me and my siblings thought, why not go check them out? I had already checked them all out with a buddy but wanted to do it again but with my siblings this time, because why not? We had only explored one of the houses previously, because there was a small window we could crawl through into the basement and another hole through that wall we crawled through to enter the house, since all the doors were boarded up pretty much. There are two more houses we hasn't explored, one being really small and the other being huge. After research on the internet, it made sense as it seemed as if the house was leased to multiple people mostly around the age of college or to younger families who maybe couldn't afford to rent entire apartments. The time before when I was with my friend we brought a screwdriver with all sorts of those attachment things that go on the end so that way we could unscrew all the different bolts and then used a hammer for the nails. When we got there the board was already torn off luckily, even though it wasn't the week prior when we first tried to go in, when we didn't have the screwdrivers. Also, let's call this house the Red House, since it is a red brick house. To describe this Red House, it is like you connect two average double-story houses together. It is that big. I mean, we ended up taking an hour to explore it, but that's because we were looking around too. This time, when me and my buddy explored it, it was pretty cool. Not too much graffiti and lots of stuff everywhere on the ground. We found old cheap purses. Pokemon and baseball cards, a bunch of broken keyboards, books and old school supplies plus a lot of other completely random things. There was even an old tanning bed that I think we discovered was from the late 80s. There were the occasional drug beetles and pills, 
usually in corners of old bedrooms or in the bathrooms. The next time I just wanted to experience this again with my siblings. This time it was night when my mother was asleep so we could actually get away with it. I dropped them off in my car and drove half a mile to a trailhead where I could park and my car would be hidden. I then rode an electric scooter the half mile to where they were so we could go in. There was this gate that we had to go over since there was barbed wire, and I folded up the electric scooter and hid it in the tall grass. This road behind the gate led to the first house we had already been in, so we were just trying to go to the big one. From here you have to walk pretty far through this tall grass to get to the red house. As we approached it we finally turned our flashlights on and then entered the house. Last time me and my friend were calling out to make sure nobody was inside but this time it was night and I didn't want to risk somebody calling the cops since they heard yelling near the abandoned houses at 2 a.m. Regardless, it was a stupid decision. We made our way in and checked around. I think it's also important to note that this isn't the front door. It is the back door. One of two back doors. The house is on a hill, so from the road IR looks like one story, but on the other side you can see it is two stories. This back door is in the very corner of the house so you explore from one end to the other. As we walked through I thought I heard some light footsteps, but this is an older house. I just looked it up and it was built in 1964, has seven acres of land, and is 3,800 square feet. So yeah, pretty big. Paz, I should have really included that at the beginning, so sorry. Anyways, it didn't sound any different from when me and my friend first explored it, and it was night so quiet sounds were extra loud. As we made it through the other end of the bottom of the house where the staircase was, and made our way up, I heard more footsteps, and this time I told my siblings we should go. They didn't hear anything, but they were also under the assumption that we were the only ones there, and they weren't being very cautious or aware, I guess you could say. When you go up the staircase, on one side it leads to the garage which is very small for such a large house, again, probably because it is older, and on the other side you go past a short hallway and it leads to the kitchen and family room with a lounge area, I think you would call it. This whole area is super open, and it feels like a lot of empty space, but it only covers around half the upstairs. On the other side is a straight hallway with around four bedrooms and a bathroom. That's when I thought I saw somebody moving from one bedroom across the hallway to the other, from left to right. But my light didn't go very far since I was using my phone light. I start angrily whispering to my siblings who are already kind of close to the hallway which leads to where I saw the person, as not to yell but get their attention urgently. They ignore me which pissed me off and I quickly walk across this open area to try and maybe yank their arm until we hear something drop. In my opinion, the guy dropped it on purpose to let us know he was there. But after this next part, I don't know. Immediately, my siblings and I jump. It sounded like a bookshelf was knocked over or something, and since it was really loud and heavy as we could feel the ground vibrate as we were upstairs, it was now confirmed that someone was there. We turn around and start running to the staircase, which is pretty much in a straight line. The bottom floor sort of zigzags around until it leads to a hallway that goes straight to the other side of the house. As we make our way around the zigzag rooms and make our way to the corner with the hallway, we start hearing running upstairs towards the staircase. We are already running so we don't slow down. We turn the final corner and make our way outside where I run in a straight direction and then to the left and attempt to hide in the talk grass which also has a direct line to the other side of the huge grass area to where the gate is. I lay down, and when my siblings run out behind me, I tell them to get down as well. We were maybe thirty or so feet deep into the grass when I see a dark figure run out of the house a few feet, stop, look around, and run into the small house next to this one which is only like fifty or so feet away. I thought that house was all boarded up still, but it looked like he ran to the side of the house where I guess his entryway was. There was a large shed thing in the way, so I couldn't see exactly where he went, but I knew there was a barbed fence over there, so he would have to run behind to where we were to follow us. 
as there is maybe a 20-foot-wide gap where there is no barbed fence, so I guess that way vehicles could enter. I heard his footsteps running around, but I couldn't see where he was. We started to army crawl across the grass, but really slowly, as to not make much rustling noise. We start crawling faster, but then I heard his footsteps stop, so either he ran away, or was stopped maybe looking at us. I kept crawling on all fours since the grass was now tall enough to still cover me, and I was looking behind to see if I could see his outline in the dark, which thankfully I couldn't see him. We started to hear a cracking sound, and it sounded like he was cracking the plywood boards, but I don't know why he would, so I don't know what it was. It then sounded like he was frustrated as we could hear loud grunts. We just kept crawling, though. We were maybe crawling for a good five minutes to get to the other side, even if we were far enough for him to not see us. It honestly felt like a lot more, and every minute felt like ten. We eventually get to the road which lead to the gate, and at this point we stop outside the gate and wait for the few cars to pass before we crawl through. I have my siblings crawl under first and I swear I heard running through the tall grass behind me, but as I made it under and through and started running, it didn't ever look like he was following us. Also, yes I did get my scooter which my brother had already unfolded and was riding away with me and my sister running behind. We did not stop until we got to the trailhead off to the side of the main road, where we threw the scooter in the back, jumped inside and locked the doors and pulled out. We drove off peacefully knowing this person was definitely homeless and could not get in a car to drive off after us. He was also probably not on anything as he was moving too quick, which I don't know if it would be better or worse for us if he was, and we ended up having to fight back. We made it home safe and sound and we didn't speak about it all near our parents. My siblings kind of laughed about it more after the first week, but it still scared me knowing how serious it was. I don't think they realize how dangerous it actually was. We survived, though, and that's all that matters. I also never plan on going back. There is a street dog near my college campus that I see almost every day. It's one of the older dogs in the area, known for its calm demeanor and tendency to nap lazily in the same spot. Over time, I've grown fond of this dog. It's a familiar and comforting presence during my late-night walks, which I often take with a friend. We both live close to the campus, and after dinner, it's become a routine to stroll around the neighborhood. The area is typically safe, filled with other students or families out for their evening walks, so we've never really felt the need to worry. Tonight started like any other night. My friend and I were on our third lap around the neighborhood, chatting away under the streetlights. As we passed by the dog in its usual place, I couldn't help but gush about how cute it was, distracted by its sleepy charm. My friend was listening, but then she suddenly interrupted me, her voice tinged with a note of concern. There's a weird car behind us. I turned around, and sure enough, there was a car creeping along at an unusually slow pace. At first I thought nothing of it. Maybe it was a family trying to find a parking spot, or perhaps they were just lost. But as we continued walking, the car didn't pass by or turn away. Instead, it seemed to pivot slightly, edging closer to where we were. A small shiver of unease ran down my spine, but I brushed it off. After all, this was a safe neighborhood, and we were just overthinking. Just as I was about to share these reassuring thoughts with my friend, a sharp bark pierced the quiet night. We both whipped around, startled, and saw the dog, our street dog, barking furiously and sprinting toward the car. My friend, who was quite afraid of dogs, quickly ducked behind me, her hands gripping my arm. I turned fully to face the situation, expecting perhaps some other dog had joined the scene. But it wasn't. It was the same old street dog we had grown accustomed to, the one that hardly moved or made a sound usually. The sight of it barking and charging towards the car sent a jolt of fear and confusion through us, 
but almost as suddenly as it started, the car sped up and took off down the road, disappearing around a corner. The dog didn't chase it far. It stopped after a few meters, still barking, but now standing firmly on guard. For a moment, neither of us moved. We were frozen, trying to process what had just happened. Then, slowly, it dawned on both of us. Had the dog just saved us? The timing of it all was too uncanny to ignore. The car's slow crawl, the eerie feeling it gave us, and then the sudden burst of speed when the dog intervened. It felt like too much of a coincidence. We couldn't say for sure if the car had any ill intentions, but the fact that it sped away the instant the dog started barking was strange enough to make us wonder. The driver could have just been lost or confused, but why leave so quickly? Why drive so slowly in the first place? We walked back in silence, still shaken by the events. I kept glancing back at the dog, now calmly returning to its usual spot, as if nothing had happened. That night, my friend and I couldn't shake the thought that we might have unknowingly been in danger. And if that was the case, this dog, this sweet, sleepy old dog, had possibly just saved us from it. Now, every time I pass by, I make sure to give the dog extra pets and a few treats. Whether or not it truly saved us from something sinister, it certainly made us feel protected when we needed it most. That's more than enough reason to give it all the love it deserves. Thank you so much guys for listening these terrifying scary experiences of people. If you like the stories then please don't forget to sh hit the subscribe button down below and also if you guys have any real life scary experience like this please share your stories on our gmail account. The gmail is in the description below. Have a nice day guys.